This episode 28 of Inner Demons. I'm going to get straight into it, but before I do, I want to say a couple things real quick. So check it out, man. Last night, I ran a live, and some of these issues came up. So I'm not going to go over them again, you know, and it's, it would be redundant for me to repeat everything that I talked about last night. But one of the things that did come up was the Corcoran Shoe Wars, and everything that happened in my experience of going through uh, what was called gladiators, it's gladiator school, gladiator days, whatever you guys want to call it. Um, yesterday, I, I did an inner demons right before we did the live and I didn't even release it. I told you guys before I'm a perfectionist when it comes to these videos, man, if I, if I feel like I wasn't up to par or I was too tired or I just didn't get into it. I won't even play it back and watch it, edit it. It'll just sit there, man. So I'm going to run it back. That's what I'm going to do right now. I want you guys to get the full experience of, of Corcoran because it is a big part of my, my prison experience, everything that I went through. Um, you know, there, there's a lot to it, the mental, the physical, everything that was involved, man. So I want to cover, make sure I cover everything I, I can in regards to Corcoran. And there might even be times where I'll run another episode and, and back up and, and cover something else that I think I missed, man, because you guys have a lot of questions and it's it's a hot topic. You know, the, the other thing is one of the viewers last night made a suggestion about me running a new series called The Corcoran Shoe Wars. Basically me going over all my experiences, everything that happened there. That's a good idea, but for now, I'm just going to run the inner demons and talk about it. I'll probably end up, um, you know, cutting a few war stories about some of the squabs that I got into. Um, but for now, I'm just going to run back the, the episode that I ran yesterday and um, give it to you guys all over again, man. So let me um, let me pick up where I left off. Episode 27, man. I ran I ran you guys through the situation that I that I ended up getting into when the first time I went to Pelican Bay. I ran into two hermits and I ended up getting played, man. I was young, my first time to the bay. The funny thing about it is I had heard about shit like that, man. When I was in Quentin, I had always heard like, you know, when you get up to the bay, man, you gotta be careful because there's there's a lot of DOs up there that are hitting in the cuts and sometimes you know these individuals can play you out of pocket these same cats were even in corcoran so we'd always heard about you know that's that's something i've talked about before in the past dropouts and the way that we treated dropouts and just the whole persona of dropouts how we dealt with them how we treated them you know it it, it was completely different back in the early 90s late 80s man again i know i sound redundant but i want to make myself clear on this you had do's that were they weren't feared but they were respected they were treated with a level of respect because they were bona fide dropouts these were guys that we that we indoctrinated they were guys that still had all our training they still thought like us they still had our mentality and just because they dropped out or they fell in the bad standings doesn't mean it changed who they were as individuals. They were still some crafty, dangerous, sophisticated um, individuals, man. Um, they just weren't in good standings with us no more. So, you know, there'd be times when there might be a dropout in East Block that would be there. And we'd all know where he was at, what tier, what cell, uh, front bar, back bar, because... We keep an eye on, on that individual, man, because, like I said, they were a different caliber. Some of these individuals will go through the whole process of, of trying to spear somebody or trying to um, somehow do some type of harm to one of the homies that were still active. You had to watch out for these cats. The dropouts of today are different. It's a different caliber. 
you look at them as like it, it's just a fucking a, a, a booming population of young kids that fell out of favor. Kids that still have these new numbers that only lasted for a year, two years. These other guys that I'm talking about, man, these cats had B numbers and C numbers and even D numbers. You know what I mean? But they were, it was a different animal, man. Um, I don't know if, if I'm really articulating that right, if I'm really getting my point across, man. But um, it was just different, man. You know, and, and we treated them with a level of respect. These dropouts nowadays, you know, I'm not, and I'm not trying to disrespect anybody or sound like these guys are just, I mean, it's just, it is what it is, man. They act how they act. And, you know, the, when I was active, the way that I treated them were different from the way that I would treat these, these individuals that were considered um, NF dropouts. So, you know, the funny thing is I heard a lot about You know, ha having to, to, to be on my toes once I got up to Pelican Bay, once I got to Corcoran, you, you had to watch out for these DOs that were lurking, the ones that were hiding in the cuts. They were in the shadows. Sometimes you'd run into them in pods and you had to be careful about being played out of pocket. They'd either try to get in your mind and manipulate you to go hit somebody that was still in good standings or, you know, they, they'd somehow play you out of pocket to where you were sending money back to them. Once you got out, I mean, there was there's a lot of different scenarios that come into play. Luckily, the situation that I had with Poncho and this other cat, I still don't remember this fucker's name, man. The Black Pope or whatever they called him. You know, that situation, it wasn't that bad. We had some verbal, you know, we had a verbal fist fight on the tier. And beyond that, it wasn't nothing but the 10,000 word essay that... Luckily, I didn't even do that. I'd have been pissed off. Like, this motherfucker got me for a 10,000-word essay. I ain't never wrote no fucking 10,000-word essay. That would have been the... the uh, That would have been the record breaker right there, man. But anyway, so... Let me let me get into it, man. So, anyway, I'm up there in the Bay, and I run into to these two individuals, and it was a learning experience. I would never allow myself to get played like that again. I went back to the Bay... I was ready for it. Now, I would treat individuals different whenever I would run into somebody or ever, whenever I would get to a pod or somebody would come into a pod. The way that I, I interacted with these individuals was different because of that situation. So it was a valuable learning experience that I went through. And then I talked a little bit about what happened with the Southsiders with, with me and uh, Night Owl, um, Glenn Marquez from Sacramento, right before I paroled from Pelican Bay. And like I said, man, you know, we were at war at that time with the Southsiders and with the Woods. And even though we were at war with these guys and I was gang banging on the streets, I didn't sit up there in the Bay hoping that these doors would pop on these individuals. I didn't have a personal issue with, with none of these cats that were up there. Matter of fact, you know, I'll say this, the, the, the Southsiders in the woods that were in the pod with me, with Bandit, before I moved over with Night Owl, there were some cool cats. You know, if I would have had to get into it with them, I would have had to get into it with them. But they care, they conducted themselves in, in a way where I respected them. You know, I respected them as, as worthy adversaries, if that makes sense to you guys. Even the woods, man, they, they didn't conduct themselves like idiots. But when I got over to this other pod where uh, where Night Owl was at, the whole, it's everything went to shit. It was a whole different atmosphere. The, the, the vibe over there was fucked up. You had one J-Cat and then you had like six Southsiders, all youngsters, and it was just a, it was a shitty ass pod, man. You know, I'm, I was lucky or I, I felt lucky that I was short because I didn't want to be there. There was no respect, no communication, just a bunch of mad dogging. I mean, that shit stresses me out. And that's why I've talked about this before, man. You know, convicts, they don't fucking, they don't conduct themselves like that, man. Because, you know, all the years that I've been in Pelican Bay, I've been able to coexist with other Southsiders, other Woods, other Africanos. Other homeboys, obviously, uh, Northaniels, uh, uh, NF members, whatever, man. Just inmates, period. 
but we've we've been able to coexist and and maintain a level of respect back there in those in those pods because it makes absolutely no sense to create more tension when we're already in a fucked up situation we're already in prison we're already pissed off it's a fucked up situation to be in our lives are at a, a you know probably at, at some of the lowest points you know some some of these cats um you know some of us got life some of us got a little bit of time but still we're all in prison we're all caged up like fucking animals so it makes no sense man to to make it worse than it already is by mad dogging each other, by not communicating, by, you know, playing all those YA games, man. Um, it's not necessary. Like I said, the doors pop. We know what time it is, man. You know what I mean? But in, in the meantime, in between time, man, let's, let's, let's live back here. Let's kick it, man. Let's, uh, let's coexist stress-free, drama-free. You got some books. Let's share some reading material. Let's fucking, uh, Let's all learn back here together, whether it's history, whether it's, you know, artwork, culture, whatever it is, man, politics. Um, let's just be, be able to, to, to maintain some type of, of, you know, equilibrium, some type of, of uh, harmony in those pods together, man. But, you know, I was only back there for like two, it's probably about two or three weeks. But during those two, three weeks, it stressed me out. Be in that pod and to have to walk by all these cells and you got cats mean mugging you and shit. Um, little pussy ass youngsters though, man. These look these little youngsters were, were young and most of them, you know, if I'd have got them in the room alone by, by themselves, and I'm not trying to sound tough, I'm just being up being honest, man. I was older. I was bigger than most of these dudes, but if I would have got them in a room, I'd have spanked the fuck out of them. I'd have spanked them, put them over my knee and spanked them, man, because they were acting like idiots. But it stressed me out to be in that environment, to walk by themselves and, and to look in and see a mean mug and, or, or not to even acknowledge me when I walk by. You know what I mean? Um, I dreaded that shit. So when the doors cracked, I actually wasn't mad, man. You know what I mean? We They came out, we spanked them, we did our thing, and it kind of changed the environment. We still didn't talk. It was still, it was still what it was, man. Um, it stayed like that. I left. I paroled. I felt bad that I left a homie like that. He he still had some time. I told him, bro, you should dip. You should get up out of here, man. Go to another pod where some homies are at. Or hopefully, man, they'll send, you know, one of their older homies back here so that this cat can give these dudes some guidance. Cause that's all it is, man. They were just young, uneducated. They were still playing the game that they didn't. They probably didn't even know why they were playing the game. They probably didn't even know why they hated us, man, because we were North Daniels. So, you know, that that was that, man. That was pretty much it. That was my first my first um, trip to Pelican Bay, and, you know, it was all the way live, man. Uh, it, was, it was eventful, you know what I mean, to say the least, and I learned a lot from it. So, anyway, I would end up paroling. I told you guys I paroled. I went through everything that happened when I paroled. It's the first time I got to parole, even though they had high control parole, or they were just starting it. I got to parole the regular way that I, I never get to. Well, there was actually one other time I got to parole like that from Quentin. I was on high control parole, but the COs that worked there, they knew me, and they were like, fuck it. Let them just drop them off in Marin with everybody else. Fucking parole officer ain't here, man. Fuck it. You know, let them, just let them go. But this was one of the only times I got to parole from Pelican Bay without having to wait for my parole officer to come pick me up or get transferred to a, a Salinas Valley or Quentin somewhere closer. Um, you know, I, I was able to catch the, the Greyhound. And, you know, I don't want I, I don't I'm not trying to go through everything I went through in episode 27. But again, the fucked up thing about that whole trip was motherfucker couldn't even get a beer on his way back to to uh, uh to the city to to San Francisco from Pelican Bay to San Francisco I had to wait all the way till we got to Santa Rosa in order to be able to get some drink man um I I wonder if that shit's legal you know what I mean um but, but I guess it is though you know those corner stores those liquor stores I guess they're they're you know 
they can sell who they want to sell to and they don't have to sell to everybody um i guess that's that's how it is man but anyway so i'd end up paroling i got back to san francisco man um and again this is one of the first times that i that i actually started to feel the effects of ptsd um hitting that greyhound bus station and walking out it, it didn't hit me man um it didn't even hit me while I was on the Greyhound. It's the effects didn't hit me. I was still kind of decompressing, just being amongst regular people and just being, you know, out of an environment where I had COs telling me what to do. I was free to do whatever the fuck I wanted to do. I didn't have nobody watching over me. So I was still trying to take all that in. Like I could bust whatever moves I want to bust right now. I don't got a gunner watching me. I don't got no COs uh, getting ready to write me up for something. or um, I don't got to be back in the cell at a certain time. But also what came with that though, man, is just the mentality of being locked up. I had to transition from one world back to the other. And I didn't feel the effects until I got to the Greyhound bus station in San Francisco. And, you know, the way that that Greyhound bus station is, is it's underground. When you get there, you're underground. So... When I came out of the terminal, and you guys all know San Francisco is a congested city. It's There's a lot of diversity. There's a lot of people out there. It's crowded, congested. And the city's alive, man. All day and all night, there's just people walking around. There's shit to do everywhere, man. That's why so many people love the city, or they love that city life. Anyway, so I come out of the, the, the Greyhound uh, bus terminal, and that's when I... I felt it, man. Um, you know, again, I don't want to sound redundant and go over all this, and I'm not going to really go deep into it, but because I was back there in a shoe environment and because it was somewhat, well, it was a war zone. It was, it was a war zone, and being in that type of environment, you train yourself to watch and observe things and you know you're 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 working your level of awareness is is at a level to where anything that moves you're watching it anything that uh, you know everything is going to grab your attention and when you got so many different things grabbing your attention at the same time and different colors and birds and cars and trees and people and and people walking uh within two or three feet of you and, and you know you feel like they're in your comfort zone it was just like damn i had to go to the liquor store real quick get another 40 man and just slide into an alley and was just like fuck i don't know if i can make it out here man i don't know if i can if i can be around people and and uh, be okay man because i was freaking out it's i mean it's a trip i think if I ever felt the effects of a nervous breakdown, it was those times when I got out of Pelican Bay. The first time being in, you know, in the city around people, that was probably a nervous breakdown. What I was, what I was feeling, what I was going through. If it wasn't, it was something pretty damn close to what it was, man. Because you know, it was, it was almost like I was like, man, I wanted to go back to myself. I, that's how bad I was freaking out. I was like, I need to go back to myself, man. I, I, I wanted to get back on the bus, turn around, and go back. Like I needed to get into myself. I just wanted everything to, to be back the way it was. My TV in there. Um, fuck it, I'll you know go back. But that wasn't reality. You know what I mean? I had to deal with it. I had to. Uh, and alcohol for me was, was, would help me deal with that, man. Um, I had to have beer. I had to have liquor, alcohol, man. Um, and and that's how I dealt with it for the first couple months until I transitioned from that world back out into the to the free world until I, I learned how to be around people again. The, the smallest things I could not bring myself to do, man, the, the smallest things that we take for granted, just walking into a, a grocery store and buying a loaf of bread and a gallon of milk. I would literally walk in there, freaking out, looking at people, not, you know, seeing people in the store and uh, uh, having thoughts, man, like, what the fuck is this person in there for? Why are they looking at me like that? Um, 
you know, is this person an op? Is this person? I mean, that's that's crazy, man. You know what I mean? That's that's crazy the way that it it, it plays tricks with your mind, man. Um, standing in line, not knowing what what to do. Like when you stand in line, a, a normal person will stand there, and you know maybe you'll you'll turn turn over and look at a magazine while you're waiting for the person in front of you to ring up their shit, or you know you'll you'll go through your cart and you you know you'll do something that. That's just normal that normal people do out there, but that's what was missing. I didn't know I didn't know how to do that. So I would I would stand there in line and literally I post up. I'd just be standing there and I'd be making eye contact with people. And if somebody make eye contact with me, it would get, I would get uncomfortable. And when I when I used to get uncomfortable, and I still kind of do, when I get uncomfortable, I get aggressive. That's the only response I know. I don't know nothing else. If, if something makes me uncomfortable and I don't know how to react in a situation and, you know, I just, I feel lost, I'll get aggressive and it'll make me like, just, what the fuck you looking at, man? You know what I'm saying? Why you keep looking at me, man? You know, that's my response. And it's, it's for, for a long time, man, um, coming in and out of prison uh, over... A good decade of, of doing shoe time, a little bit more over a decade. That's the kind of stuff that I had to deal with every time I got out. You know, luckily I didn't, it didn't get so bad where I was a fucking mental health patient. I probably should have been. Um, luckily it didn't get to me like that. I had a strong mental, a strong mind. You know, I was able to, to get through it myself. But, you know, those are the things that you have to contend with in prison that you know you have to have a strong mind man um that that's that's a, a prime example of it right there prison will it'll eat your ass up man straight up it'll eat you up being in those environments and um uh you know interacting and, and being being back there in what's considered a war zone and being back there with the, with that kind of tension and dealing with the with the COs and just dealing with prison in general, it will ravish you, man, uh, mentally, if you let it. You know, you you have to. Uh... <laughs> this guy, man. All right, man. I I got you. You you have to be able to 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 keep yourself occupied, man. Keep your uh, especially when you're doing a lot of a shoe time, when you're doing a lot of um, hold time, and you're isolated and you know this is this is a strong test on your on your mental um you know how strong you are mentally doing doing that type of time anyway so i found that al alcohol was kind of what would help me get through um the way that i was feeling out there and for the first you know two three Two, three weeks, man. It usually take me about a month, a month and a half to, to get through that transition. But those first two, three weeks, that's, excuse me, that's all I did was was drink. Drink liquor, drink beer. Um, I, I used to have to keep a tall can or a 40 in my hand. Sometimes I'd be double fisted. Early in the morning, as soon as I wake up, that's the first thing I used to do is go to the liquor store, get get a beer in me, man, get some alcohol in my blood. And that would help me relax. It would calm me down to where I was able to somewhat interact with people, man. So, you know, I, I, I had been in and out of prison so many times from 92 up until... 2003 that I don't remember like what time was like unless I really sit down and write it all out I get confused like some of the times that some of the events that happened during so you know what I'm trying to say is in 93 I'm pretty sure I remember some of the things that happened some of the things that I did back in 93 but I might be getting it mixed up with one of the times when I got out in 92 or when I got out in late 93 or early 94 or late 94. It's like I, I went in and out so many times. You guys get what I'm saying? So anyway, 
from what I remember, so I, I get out, and I don't remember if, let me back up, because let me take you guys back to Susanville, because I don't even remember if I covered this, man. That's the thing about letting inner demons go by for so long, because I lose track of what I talked about, what I didn't talk about, and I want to make sure I cover everything, because later on in the story, some of these things are going to become, you know, they're, they're, they're important that, um, that I don't miss none of this stuff. So... When I first got out of Susanville in 92, when I first paroled from Susanville, right before I paroled, I had a homeboy named Cesar Castillo from, from San Francisco. He was up there in, in uh, Susanville with me. And he was like, one day he got at me. He's like, hey, B, he was like, I'm, I'm hollering at the homegirl, uh, Flaca Negra. From, uh, I know her. She's from my neighborhood. She's a homegirl. He was like, hey, she's got a homegirl named uh, Concha, Connie. He was like, you want to write her? And... Um, you know, I wasn't I wasn't in a relationship at that time. <laughs> well, um, I was writing Marlene, and she at at one time she we were supposed to be together, but then that's when Duck pulled Sancho on me, and all that that whole fiasco happened. So, you know, I wasn't really with nobody at that time. So, I was like, yeah, fuck it, I'll write her, bro. You know, if nothing else, just to kill some time. I really wasn't expecting nothing that really happened i didn't have any real high expectations um about writing her man it's like i didn't think we were gonna end up uh together uh living in a in a fucking house with a white picket fence two babies and a dog i just figured we were passing time and that's all it was man just to kill a little bit of time and and to conversate man uh to correspond so we uh for like the last six months I was there, we're corresponding. It was cool. She, you know, she seemed like she was a cool um, female, uh, for lack of a better word. And we corresponded for the for the next six months. Now, I had ended up getting out, and coincidentally, I ran into one of my homies, Chewy, from from my neighborhood, and we were down by La Raza Park, and. Remember, La Raza Park is that park where we elephant man the homie. Where we stomped him out. So we're down there in this 67. Um, the 67 pulls up in Pala. And it's two females. And I knew Flaca Negra somewhat at that time. I would seen her around, but I didn't really, really know her. So, but she was driving. I'd find out later. So they pull up and right away Chewy goes to the driver's side. So I swoop over to the passenger side and I didn't know who the, the female was, but I start talking to her. What's your name? And we start talking and the next thing you know, I find out that this is my my uh, my pen pal. It's, it's Concha, it's Connie, right? So I trip out. I'm like, damn, what a trip, man. Um, I didn't never think I was really going to run into you and... Um, was like, hey, what you doing later or later on this week? So anyway, we make plans to hook up. We end up hooking up. I go by. I pick her up one night and I take her downtown. I take her to go eat and then we go to a club. And from that night on, it was like we were inseparable, man. We ended up getting together. And later on, she'd end up having my daughter, my only daughter. And... um you know, you guys know some of the story about me missing the birth of my of my daughter and all that shit. Um, and, and booking from the parole office, and you know, it was a, again, it was my choice. I made choices that you know ended up um, costing me, um, you know, being there while she was born. So I I can't really blame the parole officer. It was on me, man. I I would have made better choices. I would have been able to, to be there and to, to, to experience what every father should experience. And I, I did it. You know, I still feel bad about that to this day, man. I, I didn't never got the full effects of being a father. I didn't get to, to see her come out. You know, I didn't get to see her take her first breath. I didn't get to watch her, um, you know, crawl and then take her first step or utter her first word. I didn't, I never got to see none of that stuff, man. It was intermittent. There were certain things that I got out and I was, you know, I was able to um, 
to share with her, you know, I, the whole thing about laying her on my chest and, and bonding with her, um, heartbeat to heartbeat, like it was her mom's idea, but that was one of the things I did get to do. I got to, to somewhat be a father um, early on, changing diapers, throwing her in her bassinet, uh, combing her hair and, and, and dressing her up and you know, I got to be a father, making her bottles and, and somewhat, but still, man, I never got a chance to to um, share those experiences, the full the full experience. And man, you guys that that are going through that, you, you don't fucking know how lucky, how fortunate you are, man, to have little kids right now to be able to to do that, to to be able to. You know, put her in kindergarten or preschool for the first time. Man, that, that shit is, is it's the best, the best experiences that you can ask for. That kind of stuff right there. It's golden, man. There's nothing else that can compare to it. And I'm sure some of you can relate. And I'm sure there's others just like me that went to prison and, you know, we, we fucked it off, man. We never got a chance to enjoy that, to enjoy the fruits of, of being a father. Um, and it, you know, it's, it's, uh, those feelings, I carry them around, man. You know what I'm saying? Every time I see somebody with their baby or something, it's like, I fucking, I, uh, I admire that shit. You know what I mean? And, and I tell myself, damn, you're a lucky motherfucker, man. So I'm, I'm telling you, man, again, for you youngsters out there, or not even just you youngsters, for, for people out there, period, for those of you that have babies and you're able to be a father and a mother to your kids, you don't know how lucky and how fortunate you are. There's some of us that, that for our own reasons, for our own fault or for whatever other reasons, we didn't get a chance to enjoy that. We took it for granted. Don't take it for granted. Um, enjoy it, man, and don't let it don't let it get away from you. That's all I can say, you know. Anyway, so I'm trying to think of like what I can really remember from from 1993. I remember I get out, you know, I got out, and keep this in mind too. I've said before that every time I've gotten out, I plug straight into a regiment and I function. 1993, when I the first time I got out was probably the only time I really didn't function, and it's because I didn't have the schooling. I really did, I went over some of the street activities, but I really didn't have the hands-on training, and I wasn't really plugged in yet. I went up to Pelican Bay and did that year violation. The only individual I ran into was Glenn um, Night Out. So. It's not like I plugged into an NF member up there or plugged into somebody that was tapped in and then took a bunch of directives out with me and I had my, my plans or everything set in order. I, I didn't have, that didn't come till 94. So, you know, I get out in 93, I run the streets, I get back out there, I'm gang banging. The streets have a whole different look from what I remembered when I left back in 89, 88. Now there's, you know, before it was red on red, I was used to getting off with other hoods, Southeast, Excelsior, Daly City, Diablo Park, ESS, uh, Eastside Daly City, Fogtown, um, HHG, 22nd. My hood at one time, we went to, we declared war on fucking every other hood in the city. Every other hood. We were, my hood is the biggest neighborhood in San Francisco. But we were going at it with fucking everybody. Cortland, 30th, 25th, 22nd, Hampshire. Um, fuck, the list goes on and on and on. Uh, um, everybody that was active back in those days, we declared war on them. We were like, fuck all you motherfuckers, man. Um, it's SFM and fuck everybody else, man. So anyway, I'm out there gangbanging now and it's it's different. Now there's there's whole neighborhoods of Southsiders that have moved in, that have set up shop, and they're out there gangbang. These guys were out there gangbang. This is new to me. You know what I mean? Um, you know, I used to always joke and say that these guys are, they were homegrown 
They're homegrown South Siders. They call them upstaters. But I used to say, you know, these guys are, are guys that seen Mi Vida Loca um, or they seen American Me and all of a sudden, they, you know, they were inspired or the, the, these movies created this fad where all of a sudden now they wanted to be South Siders. And, you know, I'm not saying that to be disrespectful. A hey, shout out to all the upstaters, man. Shout out to all the South Siders. Um, whether you were born in Northern California or Southern, I don't give a fuck. But I'm just talking about what happened back in those days. So, you know, I get out and like I said, man, it's a whole different, the city got a whole different look. 19th is like, it looked like fucking East Side, L, uh, uh, East LA out there, man. You got 20, 30, 40 Southsiders, like they're just throwing block parties out there, man, um, on 19th and Mission. Blewed up. Um, there's no red, no Northanios out there. They, they established that whole little area. And I'm like, how the fuck? How the fuck did this happen? Where the fuck? It was, it was crazy, man. It was crazy. So, 93, I was out there banging. I was, I was banging on, on 19th Street. And I'll get into some of those war stories. But it was like that neighborhood, I focused on 19th Street. It was like, I need to exterminate this neighborhood, man. Um. These guys are thick, they're deep, they're they're causing problems, they were hitting homies, they were uh, you know in, in in this this neighborhood, they were uh they weren't no joke, man. 19th Street would let would let you have it if they caught you slipping, and they almost caught me slipping a couple times, man. I told you guys about one time already, but th there was bunch of other times i mean i told you guys before they knew me by name they when they would see me hey there's that full boxer right there and that's because i had engaged with them you know so many times or enough to where they got to know who i was just like i knew some of some of the older ones or some of the more influential ones i've been in the back seat of a police car with a couple of them where we were kicking each other you know what i'm saying um we were we were fighting. We ended up getting arrested. We're in the back back seat kicking each other. Um, so they knew who I was, man. But again, dealing with PTSD, dealing with uh, uh, getting back out, um, seeing the city for what it was, man. That's that's what it was in '93. So I was running the muck out there. There's nothing that I can really talk about that. Um, of, that I can remember, you know, I, I'll say this, I struggled with my addiction over the years, and every time I got out, 93 was no exception, I'd end up slipping back into that lifestyle, somehow, some way, I'd run into somebody, or I'd run into an old friend from that lifestyle, and next thing you know, I'd be fucking slamming some dope, and Two, three days later, I'm back on that fucking wagon. I got that monkey right back on my motherfucking back. So I continue to struggle with that also throughout the years. Now, again, there's there's nothing that I can really think of that happened that I can really talk about besides me gangbanging and some incidents that happened, which I'll cover in more stories. But, you know, one thing that, that I remember that did happen that I ended up getting arrested for was so I ran into, well, there was two incidents. There were, no, I already talked about one. So anyway, the what ended up happening was in 93 after I got out and I was out for a little bit, I want to say it was probably about a little over a month. The first time I got out it was like two weeks. The second time was a month. So I'm, I ran into a homie of mine named Rascal from my neighborhood. We're down in my in my in my hood and Connie was with me that day too a concha we're on 24th and cat I remember going into the liquor store buying a 40 ounce and I'm standing in line ready to pay for my beer and there's a bisa in front of me straight bisa cowboy hat big fucking belt buckle tight jeans cowboy boots the whole you know how they you know how they are man um Straight up Bisa, man. Uh, you can find them in Frisco at a bunch of those different bars in the Mission District, man. Just like that. And they all got fucking pockets full of money. So, 
I'm standing in line and this fool pulls out a, a knot to pay for whatever he was buying. And as soon as I see it, I'm just like, it's over. It's a wrap. This dude's done. Um, all my fucking uh, DEF COM 3 alarms start going off, man. I'm going to get this dude. So he pays for his shit. And I pay for my beer real quick. And I slide outside and I tell the homie rascal. Well, I hand the beer to Connie. I'm like, hey, hold this. I need to take care of something real quick. So I tell rascal, bro, this bicer right here. Motherfucker's got a wad of cash in his pocket, bro. Fucking fat ass stack. Hundreds, right? So he's like, what you want to do? What do you mean what I want to do? Let's get him, bro. So he's like, fuck it. It was about 5 o'clock at night. Still kind of light out. It was just barely starting to get dark. I mean, it was about 6, somewhere around there. So Rascal goes, the, the bicep cuts across the street. And he's walking towards... He's on 24th going towards South Van Ness. I'm on the opposite side of the street walking parallel with this dude. Um, and we're like, I can look over and he's like just directly across. I'm walking right with him. Rascal's walking behind him. At some point, I start to cut across the street. I start cutting straight at him. And uh, Rascal's walking up behind him. And we both, we just end up hitting him around the same time. Boom, we hit him. And it's on. So we start getting this dude, right? We're getting him. And um, I don't know why, man, I had a habit of always getting these dudes that got tight fucking pants. It's fucking gizmo, man. So this dude's got on some tight fucking jeans, man. And, you know, when we hit him, we're both. Good sized dudes. The Bices, he's not that big of a dude. So when we hit him, we take him down, man. This dude, we take him down. Cowboy hat goes one way. One boot goes this way. You know what I'm saying? Uh, start. We start whooping on this fool. Rascal's got him. He's got him. He's got him by the shoulders, and he's pulling him one way. I'm pulling him the other way, man. Fucking. I'm trying to take. I can't get in his fucking pockets. I'm trying to go in his pockets. I can't get in his pockets because his motherfucking pants are too tight. So, you know what I mean? I ripped the belt off. I fucking, next thing you know, I'm, I'm mopping this fool. I got him by the legs. And I'm, for those of you that don't know what mopping is, it's when you get somebody by their fucking legs and you're whooping their ass and you're mopping the, you're mopping the ground with them. You're swinging them around by their legs. So that's what I'm doing. I got one fucking, uh, uh, I got his, his pants down to his fucking knees. And so now I'm in his pockets. Got his pants down, his motherfucking shirt's ripped off. Like I said, one boot goes flying this way. His cowboy hat's in the gutter. Um, I get the money. I get the money, and we walk. We turn around, and we walk back towards 24th and Mission. We're cutting back up now. So we're walking back up, and as we're walking away from the paisa, I take one last kick at his, at his cowboy hat. Poof! I kick his boot one time and shit. <laughs> Anyway, on the real. So we get up to 24th and Mission, and my first instinct is to go down in the bar, to go into the bar and get on the bar and get the fuck out of Dodge. That's what um that's the first thing that I thought of. And it's probably the the, the best thing to do. That would have been the best thing to do is to to for those of you that don't know about BART, it's like a subway in, in San Francisco. It's an underground train. And it basically goes under the whole city. You can go all the way out to the, you can go all the way to Oakland. It goes underwater. You can go all the way up to Daly City, past Daly City. I don't know. Now it's probably fucking, uh, it's on its way to where, or they're building it to where you can go all the way out to San Jose. But anyway, it goes through the whole city, maps up the whole city. So the best thing to do would have been to go down into the bar hop on the train and go to another whole different part of the city and, you know, away from that area since we blew it up. But it didn't happen like that, man. So we go down into the, into the BART and, you know, on 24th and Mission where the BART's at on one side of the street, you can go down the escalator and you're down in there and you can go across under underground. You can walk underground and you'll come up on the other side on 24th it's like right across the street 
So we go down and we're about to go downtown to the Tenderloin. We're about to get on the BART and go down there. But for whatever reason, I don't remember what it was. We decide not to catch the bar and we end up coming up. So because we're underground, I'm telling you guys, we're underground. We're away from that situation that happened up there robbing the bicep. We're out of the way and we should have just stayed the fuck out of the way. But it's like going back somewhere that you just robbed, going back to a store you just robbed. You never go back, man. So we come up the, the, the escalator and we're walking down 24th in Mission now, going down towards 20, 23rd. So we hit 23rd, we're still walking on Mission. And we get as far as 22nd in Mission. We hit the corner right there. I think there's a, a Wells Fargo right on the corner. As soon as we hit that, that corner, they fucking roll up on us, man. The fucking, uh, the hooters roll up on us and... They jump out, cuff us up. They got the bison on the back seat. He's pointing. That stem right there, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, <laughs> he fucking, uh, he points this out, man. And, um, you know, he's telling them in Spanish, those are the guys that robbed me right there. So he gets out. We trade places. They put us in the police car. And me and Rascal were basically done. We're going back to... I know at least we're going back to prison. I'm hoping that they're not going to pick the case up. But they got this motherfucker right here. And, you know, what scared me was about that day that we got arrested was when we got back in the police car, they cuffed us up. Is that, you know, they were talking to this dude. They were writing for whatever they were doing. They were, uh, they wrote something up, gave it to him. And I'm thinking like, man. This fool, they're giving them information of when to come to court or who to talk to about the case. And I'm like, bro, this motherfucker's going to, uh, you know, he's going to sink us, bro. You know what I'm saying? They're, they're, uh, this dude's probably going to end up showing up to fucking court. And homeboy's like, damn, bro, we should have just fucking, we should have caught the Bart and we should have just got the fuck up. Yeah, I know, stupid. You're the one that fucking uh, wanted to come back up. So... Once again, San Francisco comes through for me, man. Um, liberal ass county. They dump the case. We go to the sixth floor. We're on the sixth floor. They put us in D tank. Um, the next morning, like I like I told you guys, they used to do DA kickouts or OR region. Oh, DA kickouts and um, uh, they used to call it something else. Uh, basically, where they don't pick it up, they don't pick the case up, or or. OR, that's what the other thing. Either uh, OR or DA kickouts. Basically, guys that are going home, they do the, uh, they come by every morning and they read the names out. So they start going through the DA reject list and they call the homie and they call me, right? So cool. Well, at least we know we dodged that bully. They're not picking up the case, but we're going back on a violation. That's that's how they used to do it. it used to be, you know. They used to be like, fucking, we'll drop the case and just let CDC deal with them. They're at least going to get 12 months. So we go back to Queen. Um, Rascal ends up going out to the reception center. They catch me this time. This time they don't, they don't let me slip through the cracks. I end up going back to East Block. And, you know, this is around this time is when it was cool, man. East Block was the ad seg at that time. It would, they didn't open up C-section. Um, that would come later. East Block was cleaner. You had Death Row over there. So we had a lot of action, radios, um, all kinds of shit over there. Tobacco, canteen items from their canteen. I mean, being on the tier with these dudes, we had a lot of access. Being over there in Carson section was dirty, J-Cats, uh, you had special program on the bottom tier. It was just, it was, it was all fucked up. But back in the, uh, back in early 93, around that time, East Block was, was still the ad seg and the old six, the old six yard, the old infamous six yard was still in effect. That was in the back where the death row yards were. Remember, there's six yards back there. One, two, three, four, five, six. Five yard was the south side uh, white yard. Six yard was the northern Mexican, northern black yard. So, you know, I hit East Block again. It's cool, man. Um, at that time, 
like I said, the, the Nortenio morale was peaking, man. There was a lot of fucking Nortenios, a lot of strong hermanos back in those days. I mean, from everywhere. East Bay car had a strong presence over there. Um, Frisco was in the motherfucking house, you know what I'm saying? You always had homeboys from Salinas, homies from San Jose. I mean, there were so many homies that we had to do two maquinas, man. They had a lot of good, solid Africanos that always came through our yard, so... It was cool, man. I got a lot of good memories. Unfortunately, you know, a lot of my good memories are from being in prison back in those days. But it is what it is, man. I had a lot of good memories. I ran into a lot of good homeboys. And like I said, we were deep as fuck. There's just nothing that, that there's no way I can explain or articulate the, the, the feeling, the way that it felt to be back there. Um, amongst good, solid Nortenos, and you felt the unity, you felt the carnalismo was real, man, it was in the fucking air, um, those of you that are from that era, from that time, that did time back in those days, you guys know what I'm talking about, that shit died um, within, the, within five years, by the time it was 1998, 1999, uh, just the, the whole, the whole Nortenio spirit just kind of died. It dwindled, man. And just being there in, in uh, being there in Adseg, you could feel it back there. You could feel the difference. So when I get there again, I go through all the the normal motions that I go through every time I go through the oil. You know, um, they get at me. They get all my vitals. I end up getting cleared. I go through. Uh, I go through all the motions, I get cleared, I get embraced, um, and I get cleared to go to the yard, six yard from ICC. So, you know, being out there on the yard, again, that's when a lot of a lot of my cholesterol really started. I started going over the bonds, I started going over the format, and you guys gotta keep in mind, I'm still an NR member back in these days. This is 93. So I'm hungry, I'm young, and I'm, I'm still, you know, I'm sponging up as much as I can as far as different hermanos, different uh, C's that are breaking down the bonds for me so that I can understand the correct interpretation. Um, I'm soaking up and I'm absorbing as much education as I can. But one of the things that, that came up at that time was Corcoran. So... You know, the, the routine out on the yard was to go out there. Uh, once everybody got out, we run our machina, and then we'd run Glesha. And Glesha used to mostly consist of the bonds, the format, hypotheticals, different scenarios that we used to, the maestro would, would um, whatever the maestro would, would bring out, or whatever assignments he would want to go over. That's what we talked about. But at that time, one of the things that was gone over um, in detail was Corcoran and it was because a lot of us were going to be headed to Corcoran and the war was on it was on um there was there there was no you know it was like this man if you were going to Corcoran you know that you were going to you were going to go to a war zone it, it, and there was you couldn't go over there and you know not engage if you got into a pod where the the you know, the opposition didn't want to engage. You had to go engage. You couldn't go over there and stay in the cell and not go out to the yard. You had to go to Corcoran and you had to go out to every yard and you had to get off. And that was it. And there was no going out to the yard and programming out there and making a presence out there and staying out there if these guys didn't rush you. You were required to rush them. That it, it was on and popping, man, straight up. So there was a lot of guys there in, in Quentin that had been to Corcoran. They had already been through it. So I was taking every opportunity I had to get as much information from these guys as I could because I knew the chances of me going to Corcoran were very high. I was... I had an indie tournament shoot program, and at that time, I didn't know how long that war was going to last for. It had already it had already started. I didn't know if it was going to last for a couple more months, uh, two, three more years, five years, ten years. Nobody knew. All we knew is that it was on. Now, we go out to the yard and we talk about 
the bonds, the format, the typical stuff that NR members talk about, the seven phases, mainline training, weaponry, covert communication, all that good stuff, right? Street activities. But again, one of the topics, one of the main topics was Corcoran. So a lot of us wanted to know, well, what do we do when we get there? What's going to happen? So we were told everything from, you know, what to expect once you hit a tier, when the opposition was on the tier, what to watch for, how to watch, you know, when, when they ran yard, what to watch for. I knew I knew some of the small things like, you know, your, your, your light had to be on. I knew that, you know, if you see people's lights that were off, that basically either meant that they were locking it up or they had already locked it up or their dropouts. Um, you know, I learned other things that, you know, some some of the opposition over there were trying to play homies, you know, as far as like they come into a tier and these guys would get at them and be like, hey, over here, it's cool. We're not, we're not doing all that. We're programming, you know, um, you're welcome to come out to this yard and you'll have your own half of the yard and, and you know, we'll stay on ours and we can do it like that. It's the gas over here, homie, you know what I'm saying? And, no, 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 no. You know what I'm saying? Um, but that's, those are scenarios that were brought up. The other thing that I'd already learned this from Susanville, like I told you guys the other night on the live, but one of the main topics too was that we don't hit the deck, man, after they shoot one time. We always make, we always make the CO shoot the block gun at least two times. Once they shoot the block gun twice, you keep going until they rack that mini 14. Now, if you wanted to continue to fight until they, they, they popped with that mini 14, that was on you. A lot of the times, that's what I used to do, man. But you're playing a dangerous game because like I told you guys the other night, those guys did not like Nathaniel's over there. And they were they were dropping a lot of my homies, man. Um, I seen it. I heard about it. And the numbers don't lie. But... Um, so, you know, we were told never to get down first once we engaged, uh, you know, the thing came up about, you know, how uh, the whole process was, was explained how they run it. You get into that little enclosure, you have like 10 seconds to throw your fucking kicks on if you had some and the door comes open and they're either waiting right there on the checkered line or they're waiting somewhere on the yard and then they'll approach you and it's on. The other thing, the other main thing, like I said, that I learned from Susanville and that was emphasized is never put yourself, your back to the gunner. Always maneuver yourself around the opposition. So if you came out to the yard and you had two guys, say you're out there by yourself, there was two two guys out there waiting for you. You come you come out of that fucking door like a torpedo. You, whatever whatever you had to do to break through their scrimmage or to get around them to where you're on the other side of them now and you got them positioned to where their backs are to the to the tower. That's what you do because this enables you this enables you to 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 be able to engage with these cats and to watch that fucking. Uh, to watch that tower, you know, I did, I did, you're, you're watching these dudes, but you're also every now and then you're glancing up at that at that tower, man. Um, and this minimizes the chances of you getting shot. It could be the difference of you losing your life, and you got your back to the tower, man. Um, you don't know what the fuck's going on. You know what I'm saying? At least this way, you're able to see if they got the real gun, and, and when you need to hit the fucking deck, you hit the deck. So those are the kind of things that we're talked about. The, you know, the dirty politics on the tier, playing you out of pocket, um, some of the games that the COs were playing, that kind of stuff was talked about. Uh, there were some hypotheticals that, that were gone over. What do you do in this situation? What do I do in that situation? And, and all those things were talked about. So I was gearing up for Corcoran, man, and it's a good fucking thing I did. Um, because, you know, the first time I got sent to Pelican Bay, on my first violation, I was thinking they're going to send me back. I already hit the the bay. They think I'm bay material, so that's where they're going to send me. I'm going to go back to the bay. However, it didn't happen like that. 
So I'm there in in um in San Quentin, and I still remember the day it happened, man. Um, they came and they transpacked me and another homie who I'll call Rudy. I'll call him Rudy out of respect for him. And I remember that day, man, when we packed up everything. Um, all the homies were were wishing us their, you know, they were sending their regards. All right, Box. All right, uh, all right, Rudy. Uh, hey, you guys go over there and represent, man. It was like everybody was was sending their their love and respects because we were getting thrown into that war, man. You know, all the the days of being out there on on the yard and and running that machina and getting out there in physical shape and mentally preparing yourself for it was now was about to all come into play man so it, you know there was a lot of building up to corcoran you know asking the questions being indoctrinated on some of these things uh, the stuff you know hearing about it asking uh, um uh, what you know what to expect um that some of the games that were being played all these things um we're being talked about. You know, the, the other thing I'm going to say is this, man. Nobody wanted to go to Corcoran. I don't care how how tough you think you are, man. How You know, what kind of facade you put on, man. Nobody wanted to go, including myself. You know, I didn't want to go to Corcoran, man. Um, I didn't want to get thrown in that war. Not because I'm a coward. Not because I didn't want to fight or I was scared. It was because it was a reality that homeboys were getting killed over there um and and the way that it kept getting explained to us is that those those seals over there they're, they're playing dirty they're playing dirty ball man and a lot of homies are getting dropped i remember they killed toro from oakland shot him in the back if you guys have ever watched the the corcoran um investigation that comes out on on youtube where they show the fights he's the one that you know, he went out there and he was mobbing on cats. He was a big dude. He's an NF member. Um, he had major hands. He'd go out there, do his thizzle, and then they shot him in the back. On the last fight that, that he had, uh, you know, he went out there, did his thing, dropped the dude, turned around and was walking away, and they shot him in the back. He wasn't even fighting when they shot him. But that's the kind of shit I'm talking about. You, you had Preston Tate that got killed in um, 1994. You know what I mean? Uh, um, that that shooting right there was foul. Everybody knows he, he was a target, man. Um, you know, Corcoran had to integrate. The integration policy, you know, basically it forced us to program together. Um, uh, inmates from different geographical backgrounds were being forced to go out there and program together. And CDC were sta was staging this. They knew what they were doing. It was a game that they were playing. You know, the other thing is you had, so Preston Tate got killed in 1994. Um, you had another individual over there in Corcoran, and I'm, I'm not bullshit. I don't usually talk about shit like this, but um, you had an individual that was a stone cold predator, man. They called him the booty bandit, man. Um, and I'm not talking about this dude that comes out on, um, on lockup. I'm talking about, um, what was that cat's name? Uh, Wayne Robertson. So this dude was a big ass dude. He's a big Africano, big dude, probably like six, three, two, 260 pounds. Um, you know, Corcoran was under investigation for, for what, what they were calling a sanctioned rape. So they had an individual over there, and I'd find this out later once I got there, but they had an individual over there um, by the name of um, Eddie Dillard. Eddie Dillard was somebody that got into it with, with a lot of the COs. He got into it, was real disrespectful, um, you know, didn't make friends with the COs. He didn't have no, no you know... He burned a lot of bridges over there. And what ended up happening is they knew um, Robertson's, they knew his own get down. So they forced Dillard into a cell with this dude. And, you know, this dude took advantage of, of uh, this youngster, uh, ran up in him, man, raped him. Uh, some of the cats that were on the tier when, when they heard it happen, um, they heard it. It was like somebody straight getting this fucking manhood took, man. Um, but, 
you know, that happened in 1993. They, they, he was forced in his cell um, with them because mainly it was because he got into a fight with the female officer. That's what it all stemmed from. Um, at that time, you had, uh, what the fuck was his name? The warden over there, his name was George Smith. Um, that was the, the warden at Corcoran at that time. George Smith was the main warden. They called him the Mushroom. Because um, um, he liked to be kept in the dark and he liked to be fed shit. That's that's his whole. That was his model. Um, they had another another cat. What was his name? His name was uh, associate warden was Bruce Bruce Ferris. He was the one that you'd see in ICC and committee and all that. You know what I mean? But he wasn't the one that was that was really pushing the shoe wars that was staging uh, uh that was staging these fights man um that was that was all on the, the mushroom man but you know all these all these things were happening in um in Corcoran at that time and nobody wanted to go like I said man I didn't want nothing to do with Corcoran but again when they called my name and we me and the homie got put on that bus man I knew it was fucking uh I knew it was going to be an experience. I knew it was on. I didn't know if I was going to end up coming back home, man. I didn't know if I was going to make it out of out of the shoe wars because it was shit was serious, man. Um it was a serious situation. You know, I know a lot of dudes they talk about they've been in prison and they've been involved in this and that and this and that. man, I don't I don't care what you what some of you say. You talk about your little slicings and your little your little pegadas or, or, or whatever you say you did, but the shoe wars were a different animal. Those fucking wars broke a lot of good dudes. Not just North Daniels, not just Southsiders, Woods, Africanos, you name it, man. Um, to go out there every day and to fight under a gun with sometimes two three four five six uh people from you know that were considered your enemy it took a certain individual a certain kind of individual to keep going out going out going out um so that's where we're at man this is episode 28 um i basically led you guys all the way up to the gate now we're on the bus we're getting ready to uh we're getting ready to pull up to Corcoran. Um, you know, again, I'm gonna I'm gonna continue to go over everything, all the everything I can remember about it, the 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 mental part, the physical part, housing, where we would you know where we would uh, get housed at and everything. And the you know the crazy thing about it is, I'm not gonna go into it. I'm not gonna ruin it. But I'm gonna tell you guys like this: the first fight that I got into, the the first fight I got into wasn't even with a real op it wasn't with the south sider it wasn't with the wood it was with the fucking africano a jcat africano with that because this individual for one didn't talk to anybody on the tier he didn't know if i was a northerner or a southerner i don't think he cared he knew that it was on out there i mean he was a jcat but he was Smart enough to understand that there was a war going on. But his thing was that I guess he thought he was at war with Mexicans, period, or anything that wasn't black. So, unfortunately, that would be my first, um, well, that would be our first war, me and the homie. Um, our first fight. It wasn't a war. But this dude was a big dude. <laughs> he was a big dude. And he had a. Uh, you know how some of those J cats are? They got that J cat strength, that stupid strength, man. So that would be the first one for us, man. But anyway, man, this is episode 28. I don't want to say too much. I don't want to spoil 29. Kind of want to ease you guys into it and cover as much as I can. But hey, look, man, this inner demons, I don't think I'm going to put out a, a war stories tonight. Uh, it's been a long day. I pulled an all nighter last night. I'm working on three profiles for you guys. Again, if you guys got any questions, you want to be a part of this next Q&A, you want your question highlighted, go ahead and put it in the community. And again, man, I know I sound like I'm repeating myself, but for those of you that have been sending in the positive comments, man, I appreciate it. 
You know, I talked a little bit about it last night in my life. Some of you that, you know, say that you got kids that are watching um, and that enjoy the show, man, I appreciate it. It's an honor, man. And again, if you guys want them shouted out, just go ahead and drop their names. Um, like I said, it'd be an honor and a privilege to be able to put a smile on their face, man. But that's what I do this for, man, um, to hear stuff like that. And for those those of you that, that claim that inner demons um, is helping you guys, whether if, even if it's just helping you take the blinders off and see things for what they are, um, I'm serving my purpose, man. That's what it's all about right there. So anyway, uh, isn't that isn't that how old boy said it right there? Um, with that said, man, this episode twenty eight, I will probably be back on with the live tomorrow, if not tomorrow, the following day. I'll be dropping these new um, profiles in the next couple of days, and I try to get a war story out to you guys tomorrow, man. I got some more bangers. Um, we're nowhere even close to being done. So anyway, I hope you guys enjoying the content. You guys stay safe, man. I appreciate the support. With that said, man, episode 28, Inner Demons, I'm out.